Hello and a very warm welcome to another episode of Deciphering Design with Dikshu. Dikshu Kukreja, a star architect, someone who has a Harvard degree on architecture. His company has a global presence from London to New York to Tokyo. Today on the show, Dikshu is going to help us understand the correlation of culture, art and design. craft have been a way of expression. Crafts help in representing different cultures. Over time, they become symbols of the beliefs of large number of people, thus being associated with unique identities. Anything which is hand-created is unique and is a reflection of the moment in time in which it was created. Due to this reason, people have continuously sought to keep traditions alive. A look around and one finds enthralled by the beauty and finesse of the crafts we are surrounded by. Today, we are at a campus designed by our office, the Karmapa International Buddhist Institute. As one enters this campus, one is engaged in a balanced symphony of colors and textures. design is derived from Buddhist philosophies such as the inward planning which encourages students of Buddhist studies to look within oneself. Inspired by the Rumtek Monastery in Sikkim which was built almost entirely in timber and stone, the design of this monastery recreated by the Tibetan architectural traditions is in brick and concrete, more suitable to the climate of Delhi. Interestingly, in order to replicate the intrinsic architectural features of the original Rumtek Monastery, around 200 highly skilled craftsmen from Sikkim were engaged, giving them an opportunity to showcase their workmanship and thereby empowering them. Using only natural dyes and pigments to paint the building, the project placed special focus on sustainability. The rich legacy and diversity of crafts in India is unparalleled in the world. We have for centuries been the vanguards of arts and craftsmanship. Yet we seem to have ignored this prized possession and embraced machine-made copies without realizing the beauty and uniqueness of something created by our own hands. Why do we need to embrace crafts? How does it bring value? What can we do? Let's find out some of these answers today and meet someone who has strong convictions about art, craft and culture. I'm very pleased to welcome to today's episode a multifarious personality, someone who is a dear friend and he has achieved pinnacles of not one but multiple successes, whether it is in automotive industry, real estate, insurance. But one of them that I know is closest to his heart is his love for arts and craft. With me today is Sunil Kant Munjal. Welcome Sunil, it's such a pleasure to have you today to discuss about what is very close to your heart as well as mine. It's about arts and crafts. Thank you, Dikshu. Being such a resplendency in our country when it comes to the different ways crafts is looked at across the country, different regions, all of it. And yet, when we look at the contemporary world, it seems that we are probably have been giving it a miss. What are your thoughts about it? Oh, absolutely. I, I could not agree more. Uh, our culture of arts and artisanal skills has been one of the strongest in the world. 
But in more recent times, in contemporary times, we've kind of given it the go-by. You don't see much of it in your homes, in your offices, in everyday use. Um, it appears that we've also started to make this distinction between high art and low art. And unfortunately, this falls in the category of low art. Uh, so paintings of a certain style, uh, sculpture of a certain type, are those getting a lot of attention. Uh, but crafts clearly have lost out. And that is a shame because they have many, many benefits. One is they enrich us with their very form, style, and the language they speak. And second, they provide employment to millions of people and families. So there are many benefits to, to encouraging and, and supporting and patronizing the crafts of India. And another aspect that you have been talking about is the whole notion of soft power. Mm -hmm. When we talk about soft power, people many times wonder. We became a nuclear power some time back. We are also a military power in many rights. So what is all this soft power about? So literally speaking, soft power is the ability to get others to agree to your point of view without having to use undue pressure, which is visible which is the hard power that you're talking about, our military strength, etc., and also our economic strength, by the way. Uh, in fact, if you look at any civilization, any nation state, when you look at them and say they are successful, they need to have the ability to defend themselves. They need to have a growing or a dynamic economy. They need to have a rich culture, uh, an underpinning of culture in their whole system. And and in our case, we are doing very well on the first two. On the third one, clearly we are losing out and that is our biggest part of our soft power. To demonstrate, if I give you an example of the US has been able to use things like blue jeans, hamburgers, Hollywood movies as a part of the soft power. Every country has built around themselves an aura of what they stand for. And we've allowed this to slip. And I think we are missing something in this. So when we talk about things like yoga and meditation and probably I would even say Buddhism and Buddhist chanting, yes. probably somewhere we are also getting on that global map in terms of being influential as a soft power. Oh, oh, oh absolutely. So the awareness actually has come back and which is the reason I'm making this point. It is time for us to encourage the artisanal skills and products and crafts, which incidentally a lot of it resides in the villages of India in the tribal areas of India. So it would have multiple benefits. And I think for the country to grow in a balanced way, it can't just be about our urban centers and about smart cities and all of that. While that's very important, it's really the balanced growth of urban and rural areas that has to go hand in. Oh, certainly. And, 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 and as you know, uh, most of India is, lives in the rural areas. And a lot of these artisanal skills lie there, but they've been declining and dying because many of the families are allowing the young people to switch to other professions or even go off to the next town or city to take on other jobs because this is not remunerative any longer. Yes. So I think it's important for us to bring this center stage, shine the spotlight on this. So I'm delighted with what you are doing, by the way, this, this uh, program and show that you're doing on design, where you look at the importance of design across the board. And that's what I notice every time I come to your home, that it's something which really showcases that what this country has to offer in terms of art and craft. I have known you now, I realize, for over 25 years. And uh, we have been able to do many projects and I've designed many buildings for you, right from industries to the BM Munjal University, to something now which I think is a revolutionary project when it sees the light of the day. We are already, it's on the board, so to speak. It's about the live museum. Yeah. And I know, having interacted with you over so many, so many occasions, that you know, culture and art and crafts, especially, so is very close to your heart. How did this idea of the live museum come to your mind? So as an idea, it's been around for a while. As you know, I've been involved, quite deeply involved with the arts. Then about six or seven years ago, we set up the Serendipity Arts Foundation yes. in Delhi. And here we widened the scope to look at all of the art forms. Because traditionally, 
in India, there were no silos or, or barriers between different art forms. As we normally see right now, what we actually see right now is an inheritance from British times. When they told us that the Western sensibility looks at arts as theatre separate, music is separate, crafts and dance are, are the, in their own uh, category, whereas that was not the way the arts were in India. So one of our attempts was to bring back uh, different art forms and look at what happens to the, at the junction of the arts. So all of these will be programs built into the live museum, as you well know, since you are the chief architect on, on this project. Uh, but at the same time, the building itself will speak a language which will be based on the heritage of the architectural designs of this part of the world, but be based on the most modern technologies, including some which are cutting edge and currently under experimentation for tomorrow. Uh, since you've done so many, so many projects uh, of architecture in many genres of, of, you've done office blocks, you've done homes, you've done universities, uh, why do you think we lost out on some of the richness of our culture which demonstrated itself in our architecture and design? Yes, that is something I ponder over also many, many times because if you see the kind of history that tells us about the kind of architecture that this country has possessed, I don't think there are that many places in the world which can have this kind of a repertoire. And somewhere down the line, uh, where it started to change and unfortunately I would say then it slipped into a decay before we knew it and otherwise there has been this tremendous uh, and such a great synergy between craftsmen and professionals or architects so to speak. The architects were the visionaries who uh, envisioned a uh, great building and then the craftsmen executed it to perfection and in our country whether it is the stone work or the woodwork or the metal work or the textiles I mean it's, it's been an amazing journey all through those crafts. So what you said about this multidisciplinarity, I think that is very fascinating because that's somewhere we have probably followed that Western model where we've kind of given it, put it in silos. Yeah. And that's what I feel sometimes about architecture as well, that we don't break the silos. We, we have architectures and discipline and interiors as another. And like you rightly said, this whole show is about, let's break those silos and look at design in totality. No, I, I have always found the Serendipity Foundation doing really absolutely path-breaking work. But what is very interesting when you talk about sustainability here is that I have heard you come, across, uh, come up with initiatives which are about sustainability but in the art and craft world. So that in itself is unique because not only are you, have you been talking about reviving the crafts, but you've been also talking about let's do it in a sustainable manner. And in the case of live museum, of course, there's this whole physical development of a museum that comes up there. We live in a digital world now and everything around us is getting more and more digitalized as we see. Where do you see the marriage or harmony, if any, between arts and crafts and digitization? Oh, absolutely, it's very much there. And, and I would say it's in many different aspects of the arts and crafts. One is in the very design itself. Now, technology is a big driver of efficiency. So if you start to use technology for design, you can cut down the time and you can imagine or visualize the, the finished product before actually making it. So in case you want to make changes, right. you make them on the fly and before you actually start the work. Where a product has come from, what material has been used, how it's been transported to ensure that there is safety and best in class practices along the entire value chain. That's true and in terms of museums I myself feel that there is so much that can happen there and I sometimes describe museums as being like libraries and laboratories. They are libraries because they are sort of the keepers of knowledge, archiving, documenting and at the same time I think of them as laboratories as in the case of live museum more than anywhere, where you actually can have craftsmen doing live practice and bringing those, uh, their, their talent and whatever they are creating, you can actually see that happening much like a lab. So I think in this kind of an environment, the whole dimension of how you design a museum is also changing. It's not one of those passive uh, static buildings that you only look at. And, and this issue, it's not just design the very concept of the museum is actually being questioned as to what is a museum now? Yes. What role does it play in our society? Therefore, the physical form 
should follow some kind of a commentary on what you see as a role. So we've actually encouraged some debate and discussion at the Serendipity Arts Festival. Uh, we did a two-year program uh, along with the British Council, incidentally, was one of our partners. And we invited experts from around the world, people who manage or run or have designed museums, to come and discuss and debate what is a museum. Wonderful. I think chatting with you, interacting and seeing the kind of initiatives that are going on, I just wish and hope that these initiatives only multiply across the country. Already the scale that Serendipity has achieved is, is international. It's really at a global level. And with Live Museum, I can't wait to see it alive and kicking soon. And I'm sure it'll be a, literally a revolutionary icon in the cultural landscape. And not just in India, but world over. So really looking forward to that. And thank you so much. As usual, it's been really fun to interact with you and talk about our mutual favorite subject, our Absolutely. arts and crafts. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Do stay with us on the other side of the break. As Bhikshu helps us understand about art, culture and design today, let's go to his house to know better because this in itself is a piece of art. Dikshu, today is a very interesting topic that we are discussing on the show. We are talking about art and culture and how design is so correlated and how all of these impact each other. You know, Dikshu, something I really want to ask you, you're an expert in this. Over the years, now we see that the, you know, the way people look at it, the way pe people are interested in art and culture is changing. It's really evolving a lot. Do you consider that the design for the same is also changing in the same manner? Yeah, Richa, I think that, you know, there has constantly been an evolution with, within our arts and crafts. I mean, for centuries, we've had such fantastic craft in our country. It's known all over the world, but there is a constant evolution to this. And what is happening now, as I see, is that we are somewhere going back to our roots. We are realizing that what uh, the last century, 20th century, was all about standardization and, you know, a global phenomena where we would start just thinking about whatever is happening in the West or in other parts of the world. We try to do the same thing. Today, across industries, so whether it's in the field of architecture, where we are laying uh, more stress on our building materials, local materials, or in textiles, it's about local dyes, pigments, etc. Across, you know, tribal art and craft, all these things are getting through a revival phase, which I think is a very promising thing because with that rich repertoire that we've had all this while, yes. I think it's something that, you know, we should not shake ourselves away from at all. But, you know, this work that you do, so, uh, what really inspires you from the art and culture of our country? So, like they say, architecture is the mother of all arts. So, I feel that whenever one is doing, creating a building, creating an edifice in that sense, it should be, after all, contextual. It should be taking inspiration from where it belongs. How do you make it feel that where it belongs? So, one of the things for me which is very inspirational is very much our crafts and our culture. So we've been doing that in many, many projects we've seen that happen. For example, uh, you know, we got to design a very interesting project in West Bengal, which is like a modern and new Shanti Niketan. They want to create a new Shanti Niketan. Now, Shanti Niketan is known for its liberal arts and its art and culture, the whole integration. In fact, it led to a movement in arts. So where, how do you do that in the 21st century, recreate a new Shanti Niketan? So for me, that whole experience has been that we celebrate the arts and crafts of West Bengal. We celebrate the culture of West Bengal. For me, the buildings became, the walls of the building became like blank canvases, where I don't need to just put windows as an architect, but I should have artists come and just splash colors, splash their creativity and create art out of those walls. So it becomes like a living, organic uh, uh, university. It becomes a learning place where you are enjoying every moment of it, experiencing it. But, you know, uh, as you're mentioning, you know, culture, art, all of this is for centuries, over years. But there does seem to be a certain sect of the art form or, you know, a lot of craft in our country, which seems to be hitting towards extension. 
you know people are not interested in it or they i would say they're not marketed as well as they are done you know in the european sit countries and stuff like that do you feel that architecture also in some way in some segment is facing so and if, if you consider that is going to, it is happening what are your ways you think that can be prevented so that's a good question because you know uh, of course at the same time i'll say marketing the word sometimes by the designers is taken very negatively as okay. if design cannot be marketed but i believe that yes we should be able to convey the message across there unless we are able to communicate with society we are able to show society the beauty the merits of whether it's our arts our craft our culture or our architecture hmm. unless we are able to share that knowledge of what it possesses uh, only then will people appreciate so i would not even say marketed i would say just pure dissemination of knowledge and sensitivity and awareness can go a long way in creating a revival of all this you know dikshu as you mentioning about things that we have in our country and how we should appreciate it and how people have not been able to appreciate it and they get you know excited by looking at larger cities and even other countries and unfortunately we always have this idea that the west does it better than us even though we are so much better in so many other ways uh you know when you look at museums around the world the places where which the cities are recognized because of the museums and you've yeah. been a part of few i would love you to tell our audience about them but our country is so rich with culture we have such great museums what do you think is missing in our country why do why why is not like you know we talk about the qutub minar and talk to uh, talk about india in connection to that you know our heritage or even a museum which exists in delhi i don't think people who live in delhi have also visited all the museums here yeah that's true that's true i think museums and cultural centers are one such building typology that they can actually go about showcasing if not uh, your nation your city and that's what has been seen across the world that that has happened so i think with the kind of culture the crafts the arts that we possess the his, history with uh, in our country i think our museums can be full of all of this and certainly they can become great destinations now i remember uh, i'll give you two examples when i was working in paris this was with an architect who was collaborating on the louvre project in uh, the city of paris now i thought that louvre is meant to be just a place to exhibit great work of art yes but no it's meant to be really a great place which can make the country the nation a destination and that's what has happened tourists from around the world flock to the louvre and that's not just because it has let's say the mona lisa or other works of art exhibited there it's more than that it's about the experience that is created there so i remember that we were designing there a complete experience including a retail center dining experience and making it a vibrant place similarly when i was working in new york on the metropolitan museum with a very famous legendary american architect kevin roche now there the metropolitan is again not just about showing artifacts because that can tend to get maybe a little boring for people yes. it's again made it in, uh, made itself into a destination i mean all over the world people know met as much for its art as much for the met ball yes. that takes place so what is the met ball it's a carnival in a way or it's just an event but it's a global event in that uh, respect similarly its location being in the central park has made it into a destination they engage in various activities with the central park so i think museums if we have to look at it holistically are places which can uplift the whole city the image of the city the image of the nation by making themselves into an attraction and not just a passive building which exhibits art, uh, art and craft so dikshu i would say that you have the art in your hand because i can feel that in your house you know sitting around stuff that you made created and even procured you know you have a lot of art uh, from indian artists something that i can see at the back i can see around everywhere else that i walked can you tell us a bit about this and about you know how you appreciate indian art and artists so for both my wife and me art and architecture are two sides of the same coin they can't live without each other breathe without each other so that's why for us art whether it's you know uh, paintings or whether it is sculptures all these things make a, a house give the house a soul or a life to it so for example if you look at this work which has been done by uh, subodh gupta who's such a world famous uh, sculptor 
Now he has taken such a simple inane object, a, an object which we all use in our daily lives which is a bartan or a utensil and he's elevated it into a certain form of art. So these are the stars or as he calls it the constellation but it's almost like an alchemical practice of taking a simple object and elevating it to another level altogether and that's what I think art is about whether we look at the uh, uh, spoon that we hold in uh, when we are having a meal or whether it's about the door handle that we open to enter our homes or offices all these elements which might seem very normal common inane can actually be uh, elevated to an experience in themselves as objects of beauty and functionality. So that's how I look at even things around in my home. So on that note, I'm going to ask you what exactly are you going to do in the world's biggest expo for what you've been chosen for, that the Dubai Expo which is going to happen this year. You're going to be designing the Indian stall. Can you tell us what, can you give us a tip off on what you're actually going to do, what Indian culture are we going to see there, how are you going to, you know, what are the design elements that you've thought about? So yes, this is a great opportunity uh, for us to design the India Pavilion at the World Expo in Dubai uh, because here is now an opportunity to showcase India at a global stage, showcase our history, our art, our culture, whatever I am so passionate about and showcase it to the world that we are not just living in old times, we are not frozen in our times, but we are a fast moving, progressive, modern nation uh, and it's a de fast developing nation and yet we have this fantastic repertoire of uh, history with us. So this gave us an opportunity to create something very unique. And I took the inspiration of diversity. For example, you know, if you take beads which form a necklace, the color, the hues, the shades, the size of beads, they all come together and form a beautiful necklace, which is an object of beauty. So for me, the beads was an inspiration for my building that I took them as, you know, mirror polished uh, metal balls which are strung together. So the balls are of different sizes, small, medium, large or whatever and the mirror polish reflects the building in multiple ways. So uh, with this we come to an end to a very interesting episode of Deciphering Design with Dikshu and do watch out the space for more episodes and more interesting facts about design.